So now let's go over here. Hello, Mr. Buffett. I got two short questions. One is how do you find intrinsic value in a company? Well, intrinsic value is what is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, bu a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of a business is. In other words, the only reason for making investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's, that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so it means the United States government bond, it's very easy to tell how much you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments. It says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It can change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are, the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. When we buy, you know, some new machine for Shaw to make carpet, that's what we're thinking about, obviously. And you, you all learn that in business school. But it's the same thing for a big business. It, it, if you buy Coca-Cola today, the company is selling for about 110 to $15 billion in the market. The question is, if you had 110 or $15 billion, you wouldn't be listening to me, but uh, I'd be listening to you, incidentally. Uh, but the question is, would you lay it out today to get what the Coca-Cola company is going to deliver to you over the next two or three hundred years. The discount rate doesn't make much difference after uh, as you get further out. But, and that is a question of how much cash they're going to give you. It isn't a question of, you know, it isn't a question of how many analysts are going to recommend it or what the volume in the stock is or what the chart looks like or anything. It's a question of how much cash it's going to give you. That's the only reason. It's the true if you're buying a farm, it's true if you're buying an apartment house, any financial <laughs> asset, oil in the ground, you're laying out cash now to get more cash back later on. And the question is, is how much are you going to get, when are you going to get it, and how sure are you? And when I calculate intrinsic value of a business, when we buy businesses, and whether we're buying all of a business or a little piece of a business, I always think we're buying the whole business because that's my approach to it. I look at it and say, what, what will come out of this business and when? And what you really like, of course, is them to be able to use the money they earn and earn higher returns on it as you go along. I mean, Berkshire has never distributed anything to its shareholders, but its ability to distribute goes up as the value of the businesses we own increases. We can compound it internally, but the real question is, Berkshire selling for, we'll say, 105 or so billion now, uh, what can we distribute from that 100, if you're gonna buy the whole company for 105 billion now, can we distribute enough cash to you soon enough to make it sensible at present interest rates to lay out that cash now? And that's, that's what it gets down to. And if, the, if you can't answer that question, you can't buy the stock. You know, you can, you can gamble in the stock if you want to, or your neighbors can buy it. But if you don't answer that question, and I, I can't answer that for, for internet companies, for example. There are a lot of companies, there are all kinds of companies I can't answer it for, but I just stay away from those. Number two. So you got formulas involved in finding intrinsic values on certain companies. I mean, you, you've got a mathematical system it's set up. Just kind of present value of future cash, yeah. Okay. Second short question is, why haven't you uh, written down your set of formulas or your strategies in written form so you can share it with everyone else. Well, I think I actually have written about that. Uh, if, if you read the annual reports over the recent years, in fact, the most recent annual report, I, I, I use what I've just been talking about, I use the illustration of Aesop. Because here Aesop was in 600 BC. Smart man, wasn't smart enough to know it was 600 BC though, I mean, <laughs> would take a little foresight. Uh, uh, but Aesop, you know, in between tortoises and hares and all these other things, he found time to write about, you know, birds. And he said, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, that isn't quite complete. Because the question is, how sure are you that there are two in the bush? And how long do you have to wait to get them out? Now, he probably knew that, but he just didn't have time because he had all these other proverbs to write uh, and had to get on with it. So, but he was halfway there in 600 BC. That's all there is to investing, is how many birds are in the bush, when are you going to get them out, and how sure are you? Now, if interest rates are 
15%. Roughly, you've got to get two birds out of the bush in five years to equal the bird in the hand. But if interest rates are 3% and you can get two birds out in 20 years, it still makes sense to give up the bird in the hand because it all gets back to discounting against an interest, uh, an interest rate. Uh, problem is, often you don't know, you know, not only how many birds are in the bush, but in the case of the internet companies, there weren't any birds in the bush. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but they still take the bird that you give them if in the hand. Uh, but it's, but I, I, I actually have written about this sort of thing and uh, stealing heavily from Aesop, who wrote it some 2,600 years ago, but I've been behind on my reading. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Um, I know you're famed for your success, but I was curious as there were any particular moments in your life that or mistakes or failures that you've made that were particularly memorable, what you may have learned from them, and if you had any particular advice for the students here in dealing with, uh, with uh, discouraging circumstances. Yeah, I, well, I made, I've made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistake, in, uh, well, not the biggest, necessarily the biggest, but, but buying Berkshire Hathaway itself was a mistake because Berkshire was a lousy textile business. And I bought it very cheap. I'd been taught by Ben Graham to buy things on a quantitative basis. Look around for things that are cheap. And that I was taught that, we'll say in 1949 or 50, they made a big impression on me. So I went around looking for what I call used cigar butts of stocks. And the cigar butt approach to buying stocks is that you walk down the street and you're looking around for cigar butts and you find this, honestly, this terrible looking, soggy, ugly looking cigar, one puff left in it. But you pick it up and you get your one puff. Disgusting, you throw it away, but it's free. I mean, it's cheap. And then you look around for another soggy, you know, one puff cigarette. Well, that's what I did for years. It's a mistake. Uh, although you can make money doing it, but you can't make it with big money. It's so much easier just to, to buy wonderful businesses. So now I would rather buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. But in those days, I was buying cheap stocks at Berkshire was selling below its working capital per share. You got the plants for nothing, you got the machinery for nothing, you got the inventory and receivables at a discount. It was cheap, so I bought it. And 20 years later, I was still running a lousy business, and that money did not compound. You really want to be in a wonderful business, because the time is the friend of the wonderful business. You keep compounding, it keeps doing more business, and you keep making more money. Time is the enemy of the lousy business. I could have sold Berkshire, perhaps liquidated it, and made a quick little profit, you know, one puff. But staying with those kind of businesses is, 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 is a big mistake. So you might say I learned something out of that mistake, and I would have been way better off taking what I did with Berkshire is I kept buying better businesses. I started the insurance business, the Seas Candy, the Buffalo, all, all kinds of things. I would have been way better doing that with a, with a brand new little entity that I'd set up rather than using Berkshire as the platform. Now I've had a lot of fun out of it, I mean, everything in life seems to turn out for the better, so I, I, I don't have any complaints about that, but it was a dumb thing to do. I went into U.S. Air, I bought a preferred stock in 1989. Uh, as soon as my check cleared, the company went into the red and never got out. I mean, it was a, a really dumb. I mean, it, it, uh, I've got an 800 number I call now whenever I think about buying an air, airline stock. I call them up. Any hour that, fortunately, I can call them at 3 in the morning, and I just dial and I say, my name's Warren, I'm an aeroholic, you know, and I'm thinking about buying this thing, and then they talk me down. I mean, it takes, it takes, it takes hours sometimes, but it's worth it, believe me. Uh, if you ever think about that airline, buying an airline stock, call me and I'll give you the 800 number, because you, know, you don't want to do it. Uh, but we got lucky in terms of how we eventually came out on it, but it was a dumb, dumb decision, all mine. Uh, and I've done, biggest, biggest, uh, in terms of, event, uh, in terms of opportunity cost, eventual cost, uh, I bought half interest in a Sinclair filling station when I was about 20 with a guy I was in the National Guard with. And I had about $10,000 then, and I put $2,000 in, and I lost it all. So, that was 20%, and that means that the opportunity cost is now $6 billion of that of that uh, filling station, which is a big price to pay for, you know, getting to wipe a few windows and a few <laughs> windshields and things like that. So, actually, I like it when Berkshire goes down because it reduced the cost of that mistake uh, on an opportunity <laughs> cost. Uh, but the biggest mistakes we've made by far, I've made, not we've made, biggest mistakes I've made by far are mistakes 
of omission and not commission. I mean, it's the things I knew enough to do, they were within my circle of competence, and I was sucking my thumb. And that is really, those are the ones that hurt. They don't show up anyplace. I probably cost Berkshire at least $5 billion, for example, by sucking my thumb 20 years ago, or close to it, when Fannie Mae was, was having some troubles. And we could have bought the whole company for practically nothing. And I don't worry about that if it's Microsoft, because I don't know it. Microsoft isn't in my circle of competence. And so I, 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 I don't have any reason to think I'm entitled to make money out of Microsoft or out of cocoa beans or whatever. But I did know enough to understand Fannie Mae, and I blew it. And that never shows up under conventional accounting. But the co I know the cost of it. I know, I know you know, I, I passed it up. And those are the big, big mistakes. And uh, I've had plenty of them. At, uh, and you'll, unless I tell you about them in the annual report, and I resist the temptation sometimes, uh, unless I tell you about them in the annual report, you're not going to know it because it doesn't show up under conventional accounting. But omission is way bigger than commission. There is big opportunities in life have to be seized. Uh, we don't do very many things, but when we get the chance to do something that's right and big, we've got to do it. And even to, to do it in a small scale is just as big a mistake almost as not doing it at all. I mean, you've really got to, you've got to grab them when they come. Because you're not going to get 500 great opportunities. You would be better off if when you got out of school here, you got a punch card with 20 punches on it. And every big financial, every financial decision you made, you used up a punch. You'd get very rich because you'd think through very hard each one. I mean, you went to a cocktail party and somebody talked about a company you didn't even understand what they did or couldn't pronounce the name, but they made some money last week and another one like it. You wouldn't buy it if you only had 20 punches on that card. There's a temptation to dabble, if, uh, particularly during bull markets. Uh, uh, in stocks, it's so easy. You know, it's easier now than ever because you can do it online. You know, just you click it in and maybe it goes up a point and you get excited about that and you buy another one the next day and so on. You can't make any money over time doing that. But if you had a punch card with only 20 punches, you weren't going to get another one the rest of your life, you would think a long time before every investment decision. And you would make good ones and you'd make big ones. And you probably wouldn't even use all 20 punches at the, in your lifetime, but you wouldn't need to.